This is George Dion of the Rock is George podcast, and this is a KNAC.com exclusive interview with frontman Eric Martin of the Hard Rock Act, Mr. Big. If I knew absolutely nothing about Mr. Big, how would you describe the band's music to me? I would say <clears throat> Rush with a soul singer. Uh, four talented individuals uh, kind of that, that's all that's what I would say I would say really cool guys uh, <clears throat> super talented melodic rock prod pop band I don't know <laughs> that seems pretty dead on I guess so after 35 after a 35 year career and, a, and an extensive tour which recently concluded Mr. Big is calling it a day you just got off of the big finish tour which ran from July 2023 to August 2024 were you happy with the way the tour went yeah in 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 some ways i don't want to start off all negative i mean it it was a it was all in all it was a great tour i had a couple mishaps in the beginning cuz i was kind of unprepared or like in my head i'm thinking oh this is going to be easy i mean i play mr big songs all the time anyway acoustically or when i have like the guys in Trickster, I don't know if people have seen me, I, you know, uh, Steve Brown and PJ Farley from Trickster back me up uh, on solo shows. But I I was totally unprepared when, when it came to Mr. Big and the amount of songs we were playing. It was like 22 to 23 tunes. And I started choking a little bit as far as like going like, oh, my, my, my throat's kind of giving out a little bit. And I, you know, I... I do vocal lessons and I, I mean, over the last six, seven months, I've been taking care of it a lot better. I mean, using not just holistic kind of stuff, but uh, there's a, uh, a company called Dr. Vox and it's like a, this kind of plastic kind of bottle with a straw, kind of it's almost like the same thing like in high school or in elementary school when you blew, blew into a little straw in your in your glass, or your Coke bottle, and you're like, you know, that kind of thing. It's hard to explain it, but it's a, it's a vocal lesson tool, a vocal uh, repair tool, and then these nebulizers and other kind of little medicine that I've taken over the last six, six months. But in the beginning, I didn't do a lot of vocal lessons. I was just playing shows. And that's that's that that helps a lot anyway. I mean, like that kind of puts a little groove in your voice. But yeah, it was really difficult in the beginning and then in the middle, because I think we took a week off or something like that. And then we played Paris and London. I'm name dropping countries and cities. Um and we played like two, two or three shows where I needed some help, and uh, instead of and I canceled one show in Florida. Oh fuck, man! The mental anguish on that. You know, your your band completely hates you for it. You know, they go, "You're not taking care of yourself." I mean, and uh, they were right. I wasn't taking care of myself as well as I should have been. Um, but yeah, that Paris and London thing. I enlisted a friend of mine, this guy, Michele Lupi, was an Italian keyboard player, singer for Whitesnake. I indirectly actually got him this job, actually, with Whitesnake. But um, he was a singer for a band called Mr. Pig back in the 80s as a Mr. Big tribute singer. And I brought him to to these shows. I, I talked to Billy and Paul about it. And I said, look, I don't want to cancel. I want to bring this guy in to shadow me on choruses and and whatnot so I didn't have to like work so hard so I could rest my voice in a, in the middle of playing shows. I know this is a long ass boring story, but all in all, the tour was great with a couple little, you know, trips, you know, on my face. But yeah, I mean, it was a really long tour. <laughs> and that, it was a really, it was really long. It was as long as, any of those early tours in 1989, we hadn't toured like this in a long, long time. And we're older men. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was, 
it was good that, um, I mean, like, yeah, man, I prepared myself. After a couple of those little mishaps, I prepared myself big time, man. I didn't want to have, um, I wanted to, to, you know, give the fans a, a, a 110% show. And I'd also, you know, looked around to the guys. When I'm on stage sometimes and I'm singing to the audience, sometimes I'm looking at the guys in the band going, am I doing okay? You know, and if they go, dude, right on, bro, or something, you know, whatever. I'm like, oh, thank God. I I, I pulled it off tonight. So, <laughs> yeah, I would say a good uh, 90%. I was pretty damn good. You documented one of these shows. You documented July 26, 2023 at Budokan in Tokyo, Japan for your The Big Finish Live release, which is coming out September 6th through Evolution Media. Mm -hmm. uh, you sounded great in, in, in this performance. I listened to the... <laughs> don't, don't second guess it like, well, you, hey, some of the shit, you, you, some of those gigs. I'm only talking about a few gigs here. That Big Finish thing was awesome. That was only about a week or two into the tour. But Mr. Big is, you know, I, I just, I know you got more to say here, but it, just to interject, our first show on this tour was uh, China. And we hardly had any rehearsal. I mean, we had like three rehearsal days in Indiana. And uh, most of it was just getting our gear together and Billy Paul and our new drummer, Nick DeVigilio, Try to say that five times every night, you know. It makes a jelly on drop. That was, it was a tongue twister, but um, and they got their uh, rhythm section tight, and but lead vocals and harmonies. I mean, not a lot of rehearsal on that part. But like when we played China, but it was like riding a bike. Thirty something years of uh, you know touring and playing together with hardly any rehearsal. And we just pulled it off. And a couple of weeks later, we were polished for this big finish tour, uh, the big finish live, which was a lot more songs. It wasn't just that album that we're seeing in the corner here. It was the entire Lean Into It album, but it was like tons of other tunes. I mean, I think there's 26 songs on that on that record, and it, like a whole acoustic portion. Um, some of the songs that we were doing uh we'd never done before ever live so yeah it was it, i thought that that gig uh was really great so you mentioned all the song material in this particular re release the big finish live you did the hits you did lean into it in its entirety you did the acoustic stuff and you did a bunch of covers yeah yeah I'm assuming that you picked Japan for two reasons. One, kind of where Mr. Big cut their teeth in Japan. And two, you're kind of like a covers celebrity over there as well as Mr. Vocalist, right? <laughs> uh, yes. I I tell this story all the time. And I, I, I want to tell, well, I've, I've been telling it lately that uh, when I, Sony Records enlisted me to uh, sing famous Japanese songs sung by women, actually, uh, that were million seller songs in, in Japan. And they wanted to call it Mr. Vocalist. This is 15 years ago. And I'm like, Mr. Vocalist, that's a pretentious, that's kind of a silly ass name, Mr. Big, Mr. Vocalist. I didn't like it at all. And that first record sold 300,000 records. And I was like, you will refer to me as Mr. Vocalist. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I got used to it. It was, hey, look, a lot of silly little names coming out of the, uh, Japan, but I got used to it. I, yeah, I, I sung um, these cover songs of these of these women. Five albums, Christmas album, DVD, uh, some live, some other live shows. A lot of a um, lot of press and promo going back and forth. All it is is basically me singing a little softer it's still me it's still the gravel voice mr big guy but just softer more r&b and i gotta wear a suit <laughs> you know um yeah it was that's a lot of fun i'm actually doing that in december i'm gonna do like a 15th anniversary small christmas tour 
in December. That's funny that you brought it up. Yeah. <laughs> I do my research. Right on. So most of Mr. Big's live material does come from Japan. So obviously it's a, it's a meaningful place to you guys. The, we grew up with these folks. I mean, back in um, 1988, I think Billy Sheehan went to, uh, Billy and I started Mr. Big. He called me up and said, hey, you know, I really like your voice. I want to start a band with you. I'm no longer in David Lee Roth. I'm, uh, I don't know what you're doing right now. I was on Capitol Records, just about ready to be dropped. Uh, my career was up and down all the time. I was, I, and my my whole, uh, the genre, they couldn't even find a genre for me because I, I was kind of R&B and rock and roll. And it's just, I was trying to be the next Daryl Hall or the next Paul Young. I don't know. Michael Bolton. I don't know. So when then Billy gave me a call, it was kind of a blessing to get back to harder rock and roll. And I, and I asked him, you know, who else do you have in mind? Who else is in this band? And he goes, just us. That's it. <laughs> And so anyway, um, so Billy went to Japan, uh, was doing like some clinics and he was telling <clears throat> them about this new band that he's starting with me and all that stuff. So he, he kind of laid the groundwork a little bit for Japan. And then 89 when Bill, uh, well, at late 88 when Pat and uh, Paul came into the picture and we wrote our first record in about eight days and kind of worked on it for about a year or so, you know, just perfecting it. Then he went back to Japan. He's still talking about the, this new band called Mr. Big. So it was kind of the early days of kind of almost campaigning. And then when we went there, it wasn't Beatles right off the bat, man. It was, we're playing small clubs, but we had a connection with the fans it wasn't, there was no um, emails and there was no computers, those, no, no, nothing, no cell phones, no nothing. I, I remember being in Japan five years or maybe a couple of years before cell phones came out and they had cell phones. <laughs> I mean, they were just having cell phones. Granted, it, it kind of looked like this, you know, like this big. Hello, uh, the construction site, you know, but still, still. It was, uh, they, they were far advanced. So when we went there and before all this email stuff, we were writing letters. We were sitting in our hotel room, kind of Beatlesque, you know, big old piles of letters and writing fan uh, mail back. And we just kept doing it year after year, even when they had computers and all that, because the letters were still coming in. A lot, a big chunk of the fans we grew up with all the way up until now. Right. I mean, we're, we're almost the same age, you know. Yikes. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. And there was just a great connection. I think I was talking about this earlier that a lot of uh, Japan still rocks. I mean, de it definitely has all the categories that America does or Europe has, you know, where you have your <clears throat> rap music and your rock music and your disco or whatever it's called now, hip hop. And I'm so hip. Uh, and all these different genres, but rock is still king in Japan. It never wavers, um, <clears throat> never fades away. And, you know, like a lot of the rock magazines uh, out there, you know, they still put Deep Purple on the cover and White Snake and Journey and Van Halen and, um, you know, just a lot of the, the, the old, the old guard, the old schools. And I think around 89, they wanted something new, like something fresh. And and they took on Mr. Big. And I think it, a, a lot of it has to do with Billy and his uh, campaigning in the beginning, you know? So this next question might be might be a serious question. I'm not sure. Uh, I hear you a couple times throughout the concert on the Big Finish Live mention your pacemaker. And I'm wondering if you're making fun of your age or if you really have one. I don't have a pacemaker, but I don't remember that part. Is me just, I look, no. But since you said pacemaker, I was like, okay, me trying to be funny. I, did I mention it a couple of times? Twice at least. Twice. Though. Oh, my God. How many times did I go, yeah, yeah, and whoa, 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 you know? Um, yeah, sure. 
uh, or like, or, or say the word baby. Oh man, that's like 180 times right there. <laughs> so now I have the question that everybody is asking you. The big finish is supposed to be the end of Mr. Big and everybody that's come before you that said it's the end. Yeah. Wasn't the end for them. So Where? what exactly does the, the big finish mean? It means, yeah, it, I'm not pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. It means it's the touring is over. We're not, which kind of bums me out because I was there in the meeting a year and change ago going, yep, I agree. Let's see, it's time that we call it quits. I didn't want to quit for the longest time. I mean, this was brought up like five years ago. Yeah, should we do a farewell tour? I mean, we're really, we got other projects going and it's kind of hard to keep the Mr. Big thing alive. And, and I was like, no, cheerleading, no, please, no, we got to keep it going. And, you know, um, but yeah, a year and a few months ago, I was totally in agreement with everybody going, yeah, this is it. Big. I even thought of the name Big Finish. So I put the nail in the coffin. Um, but now I'm like, oh, wish I had a nice big hammer to unclaw that that nail. Because uh, the band's so good and so tight. Crowds coming out. New album came out. We just... It's the momentum is there, you know, and I, and the, and, and the band, the band just sounds so tight on stage crowds. Like I just said it over and over again, but I, I, I don't want to quit, but I guess it's time. What I mean by the big finish is there's no touring anymore. I would hope that we still leave the door open. <clears throat> I mean, I brought this up many times online or even Nick DeVigilio, a drummer, he goes, um, man, we should do a residency or something like in Indonesia or, you know, or, or Japan or just anywhere like do a residency. And I go, man, I just hope we can play, you know, in a few years, play four or five shows here and there, maybe play a festival with bands and, and our ilk, you know, like it'd be great to keep that door open and, you know, no response. Everybody, I think also it's a whole year and almost a half of touring, uh, everybody's just kind of want to want to take a break, but I'm like, well, let's ride this wave, brother. You know, let's do, let's do this. But yeah, no more touring, no more no more multiple dates. It, it's it's over. <laughs> big the big lady has sung, you know. So since this was your last tour, what do you remember about Mister Big's first tour? I was thinking about that. I had never talked about it in an interview, but I, I kind of remember this. I remember this one gig. That we were playing a lot of clubs. Uh, our bus broke down twice. I remember playing, okay, I, I remember playing like, maybe it was like Columbus, Ohio. And we're playing a baseball, like a, like a farm team, baseball team, Diamond, you know? And the tour bus it was like an old Senator tour bus <clears throat> and the engine in the back broke or it was like smoking. And we, we, you know, we had a little lounge at the back of the tour bus. So it's like 12 bunks and a little lounge with it, you know, and back then, you know, the TV was like, it wasn't black and white, but it, but I remember having a Nintendo back there playing like duck hunt. So that, that, that's how long that was, you know, ago. <clears throat> and the bus broke down and here we are carrying the guitars and our equipment. There was no trailer. I, we might have had a truck, a Bob, uh, Bob tail truck that we hauled the gear in, but we are, we got our guitars and our suitcases and, you know, pillows and blankets over our head, walking down, you know, a couple hundred yards to this baseball field, playing the gig. Kind of remember that. I remember um, the crew, we only had two guys, Butch Allen and Jimbo Neal, and they both did everything. And uh, sometimes we had a sound engineer and sometimes we used the club sound engineer. We never had a light guy until we may, until maybe to be with you happened, you know? Uh, 
even though, you know, big rock stars, I mean, Billy Sheen probably saved some money from the David Lee Roth uh, gig, you know, but I had nothing. I, I, I might have been still sleeping on my dad's couch, you know, I don't know. I, I, I was living in an apartment, I remember, driving back and forth to, to L.A., where most of the guys were from, when I was writing songs with them or rehearsing and then having to drive back on weekends. And I was off my dad's couch, but I was like basically sleeping in my girlfriend's house in her little apartment. Yeah, no money, no nothing. And here's these two guys, roadie in and everything like that. And we're 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 basically roadie in as well. I remember this one time in Middletown, um, Middleton, upstate New York, and it was snowing and we're carrying our gear into the club and, I mean, it was just, I was in a better band. I definitely knew that in 1989, it was a great rock and roll band. Billy and Paul, Pat Torpy, they were just fantastic musicians still to this day, you know, but fantastic musicians. But it was just like when I was struggling uh, back in the late 70s, same kind of thing. And I just remember that it was the same old, same old, uh, the struggle was real. And and it didn't, it became apparent that the band, I mean, we're making some money back in 1991 or 92 when uh, Lean Into It came out. And that old to be with you, the little engine that could, and it put some money in the pocket and it definitely got us a light man and a sound engineer and got us better tours. And I mean, we, a lot, you know, like in, in our day, the big band, the big mu- band that a lot of musicians loved was a band called King's X, right? All the musicians loved King's X. A lot, fans did it too as well, but every musician always talked about King's X. And I think over the years, that was like us because we were a muso musicians band and bigger bands started to notice that, like like I was saying earlier about Rush, uh, Getty and Alex and Neil noticed our band and not just the, it was before to be with you. They, they had us on the Presto tour and it was, that's hard doing a rush gig because opening act is like, Oh, it's time to go get a, a beer or, or a rush poster, you know, or go to the bathroom, you know? And, uh, we held our own and so, so much that, uh, they even asked us back for the second album tour, which was Roll the Bones. Look, things got a lot better <laughs> on that Lean Into It album. The the first album tour, which had some cool songs on it, Addicted at Rush, Big Love, Merciless. I mean, there was some really good stuff. But, uh, you know, I think the record went sand or, or wood or whatever. Yeah, it was a struggle, but it was awesome. Everybody was, it was before success and, you know, (laughs) success does change you a little bit. I mean, I didn't, I don't think it changed me, but maybe people like, like, "Ah, you've changed. (laughs) I don't know if I did or not, but it was, it was the best at times, actually. I'm glad you brought it up. I don't really think about those 1989 gigs anymore i just thought about like all the great gigs that we you know we were playing in front of massive amount of people when the lean into it album came out and working our butts off campaigning again you know all over europe and america and being and then having a number one hit and blah 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 anyway but like yeah 1989 that first tour I, i remember playing san francisco we did play some gigs and we played San Francisco at uh, the stone. It was, it was on Broadway and we did the cover of humble pies, uh, 30 days in the hall. And we stuck that on the record. So our first album had a live, uh, re- recording. I mean, I don't know anybody who does that on their first album, but maybe back in the seventies, but, just to show people that, okay, here's us on record and it's pretty damn good, but here's us on 
live and it's freaking way better, you know. Let me just steal five more minutes because I feel like we need to mention while you were out on tour, you released your 10th studio album, appropriately titled 10. Fantastic, I think, blues based album by oh, you I guys. Uh, do you plan on going back into the studio after the success of the tour and kind of the buzz around 10? Okay, well, you're talking to the right guy because I'm going to give you all the good answers. Uh, I would like to, you know, just because, look, when we were sitting down at that, you know, the King Arthur's round table and saying, all right, okay, it's over and the big finish and we're not going to tour anymore. And I'm thinking of the back, my back of my head going, OK, we're not going to tour anymore, but can we still play some gigs and can we make more records? I mean, if we can't physically, you know, I mean, everybody's got other irons in the fire or some of us want to just take a break. Not me. Tomorrow I'm leaving for Japan for another pro for Tak Matsumoto Group. That's a whole different story. But yeah, me, Jack Blades, Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses, uh, and Tak Matsumoto, uh, legendary guitar player from the band Bees. But it's a super group. Got a new record out uh, coming out, you know, later in September, and a tour of Japan. And that's I'm still working, you know. And then after that, I told you, Mr. Vocalist and all that, but. I would love to keep the door open for a new for more records. I love the 10 album. I, I love it. I I when I when I was working on it, I was saying, Paul, and it was just me and Paul writing the record. I go, Paul, you know, there's no addicted at rush here, you know, there's no daddy brother. And and it was subliminal, or I was getting the vibe from him that like we don't want to copycat the other records. If anybody wants to listen to Addicted at Rush or Daddy Brother or Trapped in Toyland or anything go back and listen to those records. This is going to be what it is. We're writing this from scratch. We're not, you know, yeah, we're not borrowing from the past. So it, it is blues based. It has definitely got little Jimi Hendrix ish. And it's got, but it's got, you know, Eric Martin, the acoustic vibe and definitely got some, the pop side. You know, I write a lot of pop songs. And I give it to Paul and he fattens the hell out of it up. And that's how they, you know, they're, ah, oh, this is a great hard rock song, but it's started out as an acoustic song or a pop song. That's the way I write. And Paul just went with the pop stuff and the blues stuff and the, and the Hendrix kind of style like he likes. And he, he plays a lot more slide guitar on it. And people are like, oh, well, what about the shredder? And he's like, I, I've done that. I want to do this now. Well, I didn't want to, he, I liked his subliminal way he was, you know, the mojo or the vibe in the room was we were going to do what we wanted to do. It was him and I writing a new Mr. Big album and not an old Mr. Big album. So I hope we do another record just because I miss writing with these guys and I'm going to miss writing with these guys. I love writing with Paul. I love writing with Billy and I miss Pat and I, and then Nick to Virgilio. He's got some super great ideas. So yeah, I like to keep the, the door open a little bit. <laughs> Excellent. Well, those are all the questions I have for you today, Eric, the new Mr. Big release, the big finish live comes out on September 6th through evolution media. Your studio album 10 is out now. I'm looking forward to TMG2, Tak Mitsumoto Group 2, oh, yeah, yeah. because I love the 2004 album, oh. and the new one comes out next week, I think yeah. September 9th-ish. Yeah, that, that's when, yeah, I, I'm going to rehearsal tomorrow in Tokyo, and I swear to God, as soon as I get there, they want to rehearse, so i got to <laughs> sleep on the airplane. Yeah, it's epic. The first, that, that 2004 one was state of the art it sounds awesome this is more where well, the first one was more like a kind of american rock feel this is <clears throat> kind of both this is an american rock feel but it definitely has some J japanese uh it's hard to explain japanese animation kind of rock it's very like speedy kind of stuff some yeah. he super heavy metals a lot of heavy metal but it's still me singing it you know but and I, I'm not a heavy metal singer. I'm a soul. I'm a soul singer. Anyway, uh, it's been great talking to you. 
I'll see you. It's great to be on KNAC.